All right. I am here with Tamara Real. Uh, Tamara, I hope I'm reading this correctly, PhD in entomology. Is that what That's I see? Correct. Master yep. gardener and also uh, master gardener, but with pollinator gardens. Is there a better way to say that? Well, um, so I work as a field specialist in horticulture with University of Missouri, and I coordinate the Extension Master Gardener program in the Kansas City area. So we, we have all sorts of gardens. We have um, some pantry gardens that produce food, which obviously use pollinators. And we also have some more natural type gardens that are for pollinators and, and wildlife. So Bert, how did you get, how'd you get into the field? Oh, how much time do we have? Just kidding. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I get it. I grew up in the business, but I mean, I, I'm just curious because it's a pretty, it's a pretty it's a blossoming, pun intended, uh, field of, of study and uh, of, of experience. So, Well, um, I, I first started out liking plants, um, but also really liking animals. And so I thought I was going to be a vet. But uh, once I got into college, I realized that um, the plants are where it was at, but I didn't want to do botany. Uh, and I discovered horticulture. So horticulture is more about the ornamental plants and what we have in our landscape. And uh, what I say to people now is basically I cover anything that grows except for corn and beans. Um, so I, I worked on uh, landscaping, residential landscaping for the first part of my career, um, took some time to be a mom, and then I went back to school. And when I went back to school, I, I went into entomology, which is a key component of horticulture, but definitely more specialized. And, and actually, I would probably think it's more broad because there are more species of insects than there are of plants. So um, it's it's been very rewarding. I, I love every single day. And so you know, your you know, the experience you have with plants and then with your background and your schooling, and your education with being in entomology, I mean, it's a really unique time to have that combination of interests and passions because everything you hear, I mean, you've been here for the last 10 years, pollinator this, pollinator that, this is not pollinator friendly. I guess for, you know, I, I think I know what pollinators are. I know I know what pollinators are, but you might have a different way of explaining what pollinators are. So can you, uh, just for anybody listening that might oh, know that term, but may not 100% understand what it means, can you give maybe your definition of it? Sure. So a pollinator is an animal, basically, there, there's different ways that things get pollinated. So when I'm thinking of a pollinator, I'm thinking of an animal that could be, you know, a bird or a bat or our insect pollinators that help bring pollen from one flower to another flower. So that's, that's essentially what pollination is. It's pollen getting transferred from one flower to another to allow the plant to produce seed. So now that we're all starting to, the pollinator is starting to become kind of a buzz term. And it's one of those things that loses, might lose a little bit of influence, a little bit of sway, but, but why is that term and or the pollinators themselves so important? What role do they play? Uh, what does it, why does it, why do they matter for the average person? Great question. So, um, well, first of all, do you like to eat? So, um, when we think about what, what pollinators do for us and in that uh, moving pollen from one plant to another, that helps the plants to create, uh, to create their seeds or their fruit, um, which helps their seeds. And, and a lot of the things that we eat, in fact, about one third of every bite that we take is thanks to a pollinator. And a lot of the most delicious foods, so our fruits, oranges, fruit, uh, apples, you know, all of these different things that we really enjoy eating, pollinators have been involved. And without the pollinators, we wouldn't have any of them. Have you seen those pictures where there'll be a grocery store that ha has, it's full of food. And then if we removed our pollinators and we took out the food that were associated with the pollinators, would be left with a rather bland diet. Any, anything that's made out of chemicals, yeah. <laughs> so, so actually, I mean, that's only part of my answer. So it, it goes so much farther than that because that's that's kind of a selfish way to look at it. So we, we really like to eat. We really like um, the food that they produce, but pollinators do so much more than that. So when we're looking at perhaps a species continuation, plants need the pollen to get transferred so that they can actually produce a seed so they can continue their, their species. With that, um, we're going to have greater diversity in, in our um, 
in our world. So like the, the background that I have here, a, a field with all these different kinds of flowers, we wouldn't have these if we didn't have pollinators. And having a diversity of species is really important when we're looking at um, not just food, but when we're looking at medical cures, uh, a lot of things can actually come from plants. Plants also are really important when we're looking at stabilization of soils and um, like riverbanks and uh, stream banks and things like that. So pollinators are, are a key component of, of helping our plants to continue, which help our, our world um, be, be a, a good place. Um, it, it, they really help our ecosystems. You said you said a mouthful there, and there's so many different ways we can go go off that. And here, you know, in St. Louis, where we have two, you know, the biggest rivers, North America, converging, and water runoff is a massive, massive issue here. Um, but you know, the storm banks, you know, and with a lot of the invasive, uh, you know, we got the invasive honeysuckle that's taken over all the storm banks that doesn't do a good job of holding these banks but with the pollinators and the ability of them to spread a lot of these natural, uh, these uh, native plants throughout these areas to help hold these, these uh, the storm banks are, are an absolute uh, major uh, improvement to our uh, ecosystem, local ecosystem here as well. So I guess, can you, so, I mean, obviously the birds, obviously there's different ways the birds can spread uh, a lot of these things and most of it's through their droppings that they drop the seeds through it all, but, uh, can you, a like butterfly, a lot of people probably think of butterflies, maybe hummingbirds, uh, these different types of um, pollinators such as those, because you see them in the garden, you see them in the flowers. Is there any kind of pollinator out there that you might think is, like, you never assume that it would be a pollinator? You mentioned bats, and I honestly never would have thought of a bat being a pollinator, but I guess, can you give a couple of examples like that? Well, sure. So a lot of people, when they think of pollinators, they think of honeybees or they think of bees generally, which, which is really good. Um, and, and I'd like to actually get back to that a little bit more. Um, but some maybe more surprising pollinators, um, beetles, flies, um, really anything that, that may get on a flower and, and then go to another flower. So we have a lot of beetles that, that are pollinators. And I would say that they are kind of accidental pollinators. They are happening to be on a flower and they might happen to make it to another flower. Uh, compared to, and here I go, I'm just gonna go off into this uh, go for subject. It. Go for it, go for it, okay? it's perspective, I like it, go for it. <laughs> okay, so um, these, these kind of accidental pollinators that I'm saying that, that just happen to be on, on flower to flower, bees, and I'm talking honeybees and our native bees, they are intentional about going for certain flowers. They are intentionally going to flowers to gather pollen and nectar to feed themselves and also to feed their brood. And so, so some really major advantages of, of bees is they're also true to flower types. So they are intentionally going from like, if, if they find a patch of, of black eyed Susans, they're going to stay within that patch, which really helps um, transfer that pollen from the same species of flower um, to others so that it's, it's beneficial. The others like I call beneficial or accidental pollinators, they're still important, um, but they're a little bit surprising, but our bees really are where it's at. And then flies actually are our second most important pollinator. And a lot of people are very surprised about that because they didn't realize that flies were actually important. <laughs> or, yeah, I see. Or I, I, yeah, they're not just a nuisance. <laughs> nope, nope. So, well, I guess, I mean, is, is there something, I mean, I'm not, again, this is not my field of specialty, but, you know, I always just see them biting my, biting my arm or biting the kids and, uh, what, I guess, how, or is there something about the flower that attracts them or is there something they actually eat out of the flower or that, or I guess, can you explain that a little bit? About flies? Yeah. Yeah. So um, flies, well, if you were to go out and look at some fruit trees that are in bloom right now, uh, you probably would see more flies than bees and they're feeding on the pollen or nectar. Well, probably nectar because, because they have more of a, a, a siphoning mouth part. Um, but they, a lot of them actually look like bees. So people might think that they're bees, but it's a Batesian mimicry that they look like bees. They can't sting, but they, they look like bees. So not all flies are pollinators, but a lot of them are. And there's actually some trees like our native uh, Missouri pawpaw tree 
uh, that relies on flies for pollination. Bees don't pollinate that, that plant, but flies do. Well, that's that's a that's a, a, a very interesting uh, perspective because I I've never I you know, I've never would have put that all all together. That's that's very pretty cool. So now when the uh, whatever's flying around the uh, fruit trees, so my kids not to be so scared about them all the time. And my oldest freaks out about anything that flies or buzzes. Uh, so you wanted to touch on bees, and bees is such a huge topic. Um, you know, and I don't have any stats in front of me or anything else, but I always see articles. Uh, whether it's in trade magazines or tr trade websites or even the news about declining bee population or major impacts, uh, major influxes in the bee population, whether it's localized or just on kind of a more of a macro level. Um, so let's jump. Let's let's jump on that. This is this is going to be good. So the we okay. So there there's so much here. Um, we can pretty much boil it down to why the three major topics of why there's a loss of, of, of population for our bees and, and really insects in general. And that would be loss of habitat in quantity and quality, uh, pesticide use, and, um, and then also it, it's diseases and, and pests that are, are affecting our pollinator populations. And so, Let's, let's break it down. Um, we can start with loss of habitat. So people have um, generally throughout time, they've had gardens and we've had kind of a polyculture. So if they had a garden, they would have lots of different things growing. And, and with that, you'd have things that were blooming at various times of the year as well. Some advantages with that is that uh, one with many different kinds of plants, we're going to each, they're going to be able to have a better nutrition. So just like we are supposed to eat the rainbow, bees, if they were to eat the same thing every single day um, for the entire year, they're going to be lacking some of those nutrients. And so by having a polyculture, uh, they're able to get a broader spectrum of, of nutrients. Also with having flowers that are available all throughout the year, we don't have to worry, well, they don't have to worry about uh, finding food or relying on sugar water, which is what a lot of beekeepers have to give their bees if, if there aren't things in bloom. So in more recent history, people have moved into the cities and, and out where the agricultural areas are, a lot of them are monocultures and they might be in bloom a couple weeks out of the year, uh, but for the most part, it's all the same thing and, um, and things aren't necessarily in bloom. So now bees have to fly further to be able to find food and they have less variety. So we definitely have a nutritional deficiency um, that can uh, make other problems bigger. When we so, look at, oh, go ahead. Uh, so so um, this makes a, an interesting thought I had is with everybody moving in more urban areas, is there a, is there a, certain size garden that's too small or um, for just to kind of promote what, what you're talking about here? Or oh, I love pot, that. If a pot, <laughs> is it just, is it have to put a pot with a pack full of flowers on the porch or like, I guess, I guess what, what would, if you said, okay, if I had my wish and we could do something that was most minimal that everybody, if everybody just did this, this would be, this would be fantastic. Oh, this is, this is great. So let's jump right into solutions. Um, so, Everybody well, can plant. We'll, we'll take a problem. We'll take. We'll, 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 we'll talk about solutions because this is. I'm, I'm going off what just hit. was firing in my brain right now. No, but but you're so right. Um, there there. I don't think that there is a garden that's too small. If there are people that live in apartments that really don't have any space, but you might have a, you might have a balcony. You might have something that you can put out there. Just a container garden. Uh, you can have a windowsill garden. There there are lots of different things that you can. Uh, put out there so that at least you're contributing something. And a lot of people who live in some sort of an apartment that maybe they can't have things growing outside, there are community gardens. So you could adopt a plot and you could grow food there. Um, if you happen to have a little bit more space, uh, find a place in your yard that, that gets about six to eight hours of light a day and you can grow vegetables there, or you can also put a, a wildflower garden there. You can plant wildflowers along your fence line maybe you're not going to mow so much um, and, or at least leave certain areas of your, large, of your yard that aren't mowed. Um, 
or you can actually plant um, clover in your lawn or let some other, you know, we call them weeds, but they're, a lot of them are flowers and they're great to grow in your lawn. So there are a lot of things that people can do. Um, Most and, landscapers and I, probably I, have a lot of clover in their own yards right now because they can't get to mowing them. <laughs> I don't, I don't mind yep. them. So I'm like, you're, telling, you're describing my yard perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> And, and something else that goes with that, some people live in areas where the HOA says, oh, you can't have uh, weeds growing in your, in your yard, but maybe that's just the front yard. So maybe in your backyard, you can let things go a little bit more wild, or at least in a part of your yard, you can let it go a little more wild. You know, something else too is, I mean, there's a lot of homes now where, I mean, I've, I've just watched them clear like 200 acres of just, just dense wooded area and just put, you know, just a bunch of, you know, three different styles of homes over, over again and again, but some of these lots back up to wood lines still, which is nice. And a lot of these homeowners don't think about that's a perfect place to put kind of a, a kind of a woodland-esque uh, wildflower along that just to re-naturalize it and start to pull, you know, all the, you know, the beneficial animals and insects and everything from the woods to the edge just to try to promote back, getting back what was lost before as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We, my, my father and I, we used to, we used to, uh, spread our old house we used to spread wildflower seeds all along the uh, creek bank where we had a bunch of pine trees and stuff just to get wildflowers to grow and it was it was a I remember that when I was like seven or eight years old where we, we used to do that all the time so and then we have a uh uh talked about this in our podcast before I also I have these five raised cedar boxes and the center one is centered on the kitchen window let's go by the kitchen window and my, we have three boys, so my wife is constantly at, at the uh, kitchen window trying to feed them all the time. So I made the center one something beautiful. So we got all these nat natural uh, wildflowers there. And she's got hummingbirds that you can time when they come to the window, literally just at the window, just they kind of just watch her as she's at the window all the time, which is which is really cool. So a lot of cool things that a lot of people don't, don't, don't think that are at a benefit, but those experiences like that are just, it's something that's it's a, uh, it's a, it's a fringe, but it's an added benefit that you just don't, don't realize is there besides all the good you're doing for the environment. Oh, it really is. Uh, just, just having all these different plants and, and sending your kids out. I, I have boys too. And so it's, it's so nice to just send them outside and, and let them, let them be bored mm -hmm. because then they start discovering these other things. Um, I, I, I do a column for a uh, Kansas city gardener and the, the question, um, that it, it, well, it's called kids ask Dr. Bug. So people can send questions on Dr. Bug. Um, and I answer them. The question that came in this time was how do I make an insect collection? And so there's some instructions for making an insect collection and you can do it with a camera or you can actually collect them. And if just, just with that, some people are like, oh, well, if you're collecting bugs, isn't that hurting um, our insect populations, but you're taking so few out and you're learning so much that when people really get to study insects that closely, they become an advocate for conservation. So yes, plant flowers, get out there, <laughs> look at them. And if you collect a few, I think that's great too. Uh, so the next thing you, you brought up was, I mean, unless, unless you have anything else you want to add to the quantity and quality of the gardens, um, go ahead. Well, um, quantity and quality of, of habitat, um, we talked about flowers. There, there are other things that are causing problems um, to our insects. And, and I mentioned that with uh, like pesticide use for obvious reasons, mm -hmm. we yeah. pesticides yeah. are a problem. Do you wanna talk about that just a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, wanna, I, wanna, <laughs> okay. I wanna hit each of these topics. And, and I'm sorry, I, there was one question I did have is with a lot of the plants that are being bred now to not reproduce for, you know, patent reasons or because, you know, they, they want to, you know, they want you to rely on buying that plant, not harvesting the seeds, those kind of things. Is there anything that's detrimental about any of those kinds of plants to bees or pollinators in, in general, or is it still the same thing? It's just, I, I, I'm not, that's not my area of expertise. I'm just, this is just something that popped in my head. Well, there, there is, um, some people are saying that there, some of these cultivars that we have, like you said, they can, they can maybe ha be bred to not have as much nectar or pollen because we want to have more flowers in those. Uh, there's some questions of whether or not these actually, um, some of them maybe, maybe just didn't have a lot of nectar to begin with. Uh, we need to do more research to find that out. But how about, I'm going to say maybe focus on native plants if you can. Um, native plants 
have a lot of advantages. Uh, they're not a silver bullet. Some people think, oh, I'm going to plant native plants and that's going to just take care of everything and I'm not going to have any problems. That's not true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you still have to make sure you're in the right plant in the right place. Um, and fortunately, we have a lot of native plants here in, in the Missouri area that um, look absolutely stunning in a yard, but have the added benefit of being um, aligned with our climate. So they're going to do well in the different seasons that we have. They're going to have deeper roots. And so then they're going to um, not, uh, not need so much water perhaps. Uh, like I said, though, you still need to do your, get a soil test. You need to find out if you have alkaline soil versus acidic soil um, and know what, what kind of things that these plants are going to need. They, they still have sun requirements. Some of them like more sun than others. Um, some of them are, are, might tend to have other problems or might need to be in clay soil or might need well-drained soil. So you still need to pay attention to all of those with native plants, but um, our native plants usually have a more simple uh, flower, which allows bees to get in there and get that nectar and pollen easier than some of these double flowered cultivars that we have. And added to that, I mean, there's a lot of native, native R's which have been cultivated from, from a lot of them that are still gonna perform the same way, just a little easier to maintain, may fit some of these post stamp yards a little bit better than, than the you know, uh, native blue stem versus the, the, the uh, little blue stem grasses that, that are out there. So, um, That's true. Right, so, yep. pesti so pesticides, um, anything, is there anything that, should, that stands out in particular? Is it just is it all pesticides? Is there certain pesticides? I'm not trying to call out any, any organizations or anything, but uh, I just, or is there a certain um, molecule or chemical in pesticides to watch for if you are gonna use a pesticide? Good question. Um, again, I'm, I'm not gonna be calling out any companies either or specific uh, pesticides, but what I will say is that um, if you find that you have problems that you need to deal with, you need to become familiar with something called integrated pest management or IPM. And some of the steps that are involved with IPM are first understanding um, that you can do things to prevent the problem in the first place. So putting the right plant in the right place um, helps you have a healthier plant, which is able to defend itself against other insects or diseases. Uh, if you do see a problem, first you need to identify it. Uh, and if it's an insect, um, probably down to species, if you can, to make sure that you are um, going to be able to uh, know the life history of it, uh, when it would be a proper time to, to deal with the situation. Sometimes it's too late and you just have to wait till the next one. Um, and you need to monitor and make sure that uh, you understand what threshold level you have. I'm not getting to the chemical part on purpose because that is like the very last possible stage in IPM. So I'm just going to run you through yeah, IPM yeah, really yeah, you're fast. Good. You're good. You're good. No, you're good. You're good. You're good. So we're, you identify, you monitor, um, you understand what your threshold is. In my, in my vegetable garden, I love tomatoes. Okay. So I plant a lot of tomatoes and I happen to know I'm going to get tomato hornworm or tobacco hornworm. They look almost the same but they can actually, they can just eat an entire plant. But you know what, for me, that's okay because I really like the moth that it turns into. That hummingbird moth or hawk moth is mm -hmm. just really beautiful. So I plant enough for both of us. And um, so to me, I have a pretty high threshold for damage when I might have to do something about it. On the other hand, my squash plants, uh, that squash bug comes in and it'll just destroy the whole thing. So what I'm doing this year is I'm not even planting squash plant um, because I, I don't want to have to put things in my garden that would be toxic. So if you get to a point where you do need to apply a chemical um, and, and really anything is a chemical, so we're not talking synthetic <laughs> or organic, yeah. they're all chemicals, but use the absolute least toxic the least toxic chemical that you can possibly get away with and still get the results. So that might be a horticulture oil. It might be a soap. It might be something like that, that can take care of the problem. Um, there are some pesticides that are way more toxic to our pollinators than others. And that would include those that are systemic that can actually get into the pollen and nectar 
And, and then our pollinators are going to get that and, and it, it can kill them or maybe it doesn't kill them, but it has sublethal effects and that can affect their offspring. And, and so we need to be very, very careful. If you do need to apply a pesticide like that, try to do it when the flowers are not in bloom or when the plants aren't in bloom and there's no flowers. Try to, uh, if you have to apply something, maybe don't do a dust, which has the residual and it's gonna get on our bees or our butterflies or any of those. Um, if you still need to apply, do it when bees aren't out there. So uh, like an out, uh, bees are out there usually about an hour before sunrise and about two hours after sunset. So do it other times. You can do it at night so we don't bug our, our, um, our pollinators. Um, if the plants are not in bloom, but there are maybe weeds that are out that are in bloom, perhaps you can mow those down so that they're, they're not attracting pollinators to the area that you had to treat. There's a lot of things that we can do if we do need to apply chemicals. Uh, again, least toxic, try to do it when they're not blooming. Um, and that, that will at least give some sort of protection for our pollinators that are out there. I know my, you know, my wife and I were, my, my wife really has become a lot more, uh, a lot bigger proponent of all the organic and watching what we're eating uh, in our food. And she loved, now she's before, she's like, we got to wash these vegetables. Now she's like, oh my gosh, let's go get the, look at, the, look at everything you've got going in the garden. Let's get some of that. Let's bring that in. It's just peace of mind knowing we know what's in the soil. We know how it's taken care of, to be honest. We don't touch it at all because we've had such a great spring. It's the best garden we've ever had since we've been in the house. Um, you know, and so we know that everything we have, we bring it in. It's fresh. The kale's a little crunchier. The lettuce is, feels a little fuller. I mean, everything about it is, is, is nice. And then the tomatoes we get out of it are, are nuts. And you were mentioning about, um, you know, having enough for you and uh, anything that might be uh, the, the worms that we're eating them. I mean, just in six plants, it's more than enough that we could ever eat just in six tomato plants, more than enough we could ever eat. If you got oh, one, absolutely. okay, I can see it be an issue. But even two, there's so much produce on those. It's so hard to keep up with, unless you're literally at home every day tending your garden. So, um, so, so pests. So let's talk about pests. Now, is this, is this like maybe, do we introduce the pest on accident? Like whether it's, you know, our, having pets around gardens or is it just pests that naturally occur? I mean, what, what, so talk, talk about what pests are bothering the pollinators right now. Uh, well, um, for pests that uh, are harmful to our pollinators, um, I'm gonna, let's look at bees, for example. Mm -hmm. There's the Varroa mite. So it's, it's a mite, it's, it's an invasive species uh, and, and it is really large compared to the honeybee. It basically be like having a dinner plate on your body, like that's that's about a size comparison, and it's sucking the body fluids from a bee, and it can also vector diseases. So, um, that that is harmful to our bees. Um, there are other mites that are out there, tracheal mites. Um, there are other uh, insects that can get in their hive, like the small hive beetle. So there are a lot of pests that they're dealing with, and. Um, we're not necessarily like having you, having your pet out there isn't necessarily what's going to bring it around, but the bees uh, yeah, are. I'm, just, I'm going out <laughs> just a, ra a random crazy question. I, said, <laughs> I never heard of it being anything, but I figured I'd ask the question. <laughs> no, it's, it's fine, but, um, but the bees, I mean, they're flying from three to five miles from their hive. And, and so they're, they're going all over the place. So, so there's, they, they can get it if they happen on a flower that another bee was on that, yeah. and, and they're rubbing shoulders with them, or that maybe something was a virus or whatever that was left on the flower and another bee comes. So they're, they're able to get it, get these different uh, problems many different ways. Uh, and, and it isn't just our honeybees, our, our native bees can also be exposed to many of these things. We, we really need more research for native bees. Native bees are much more plentiful uh, than our than our honeybees and they're probably better pollinators as well, but uh, we just don't have much research on them. So anyway, so our bees are out there. Uh, they can definitely get these, um, not necessarily from us, but they're dealing with a lot. And that that's one of the reasons why we need to have better nutrition. We need to make sure that they have more flowers um, all throughout the year so that if they have proper nutrition, they're able to fend off some of these diseases and pests. Uh, as long as they're healthy, just kind of like the right plant in the right place, 
our bees need to have uh, healthy bodies so that they, they can be able to fend off diseases. Yeah, I, I always, I've always heard of mites, uh, you know, going after the bees, but in the way you just described it, basically having a dinner plate, you know, on your body, you never, I don't think anybody really thinks about, you know, an you know, insect as a bee. It's a lot of people don't like bees, they don't want them around pools, those kind of things. So they see them more as detrimental than, than beneficial. Um, but they don't understand that they too also have their own problems that affect them because it gets down such a small granular scale that it's just, it's out of sight, out of mind. It's just something I don't think about. But then going back to where we started this whole conversation off about the benefits and the, uh, how beneficial all the pollinators are, but especially these bees being one of the, you know, being the largest pollinator uh, insect that we have, largest pollinator group that we have, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. And uh, I don't and I think a lot of people here also is, oh, well, it affects the entire food supply. Without them, you wouldn't have this, that, and the other thing. Well, they, it's, I don't think people grasp, it's, they're just, it's so far from, from how they actually think about uh, the environment, uh, whether it's, you know, insects and pollinators such as bees and or just their garden that's out there or what they're spraying or just what they're doing on a daily basis because it's just what they know how to do or just what they know that how to do just from repetition. Uh, the impact is ever reverberating, you know, if through, through over time, years and years and years of compounding, it's going to add up over time. Uh, and I think it's awesome. I think it's a great thing that, that everybody's starting to become more aware of uh, every move that we make as, you know, I'm going to call it a human species uh, on this earth, because there's a lot, there's a, there's a lot that we can do to kind of revert back and get things in order without sacrificing our way of life. And I think that leads out to a great, a great question is, is, with everything that you're involved in, uh, with the extension, is there any, any place that uh, our listeners can go to, to find out more kind of like the nuts and bolts of some simple things that they can do to promote pollinators, um, or to be a better steward of their gardens to promote pollinators and those kinds of things? Oh, I was hoping you were going to ask that. <laughs> yes, of course there are. We, we in Extension have a lot of different programs. And, and so like the master Extension Master Gardener program is, is a great program. You, you learn a lot of things, but it's, it kind of has a different focus. And it also has volunteer work, which I strongly recommend to any, any of your listeners. Master Naturalist uh, program is fantastic. It's kind of a, a general wildlife uh, program that can help people learn about many different things, including insects. We do have a specific program called the Master Pollinator Steward Program that focuses on, on our pollinators. So all of our pollinators, um, so like we talked about the birds, bats, um, butterflies, bees, all, all of these pollinators, um, but it, it talks about also plant pollinator relationships. Um, we talk about entomology in general, so you do get an entomology background. Um, each one of these could be like a full semester class, but we fit it into like three hours. <laughs> so like I said, we start with the, we start with insects, then we do plant pollinator relationships. Then we talk about uh, our honeybees. We then talk about native pollinators and then uh, agriculture and the environment. So it, it really is a very, um, widely encompassing uh, course that, that covers all these, all these different integral parts about pollinators and, and what you can do, but you come away with kind of a botany and entomology background um, and put it all together and, and leave learning, leave knowing what it is that you can do and make a difference. So do you guys have resources for uh, all different age groups? Like maybe for kids where it's more obviously picture focused, so they can kind of grasp some of the concepts that are going through. Or is it's really more geared towards your homeowner gardener or people that are really avid gardeners, just out of curiosity. Because I, I haven't seen the, I haven't seen the link yet, but I'm excited to get into it to see it because because this stuff interests me. We're, we're there's a, a, a garden we want to build, a pollinator garden we want to build out in our front uh, landscape berm in front of our garden center. So uh, this is this ties in perfectly. Well, good. So so this is a relatively a relatively new program. Um, we, it's only been here for a couple of years. So right now it is focused really for adults. 
Um, it, it could be homeowners. Um, we have people who are extension master gardeners, master naturalists, educators, uh, and people who have never taken an extension class before. A lot of people who have taken it, but it is primarily focused on adults right now, though we have had requests to expand uh, for, for kids as well. And, and so that is a possibility um, in, in the future. I wish that I could say that we had resources uh, right now yeah. for kids. My oldest would just eat this stuff up though. He would, he would, he would like, he loves working in the garden. If I go out and say, he goes, go to the garden. And so, I mean, any, if I put stuff into him, he, he, the kid just reads and learns and just, and then he would, he would eat it up. So that's why I was, why I was curious. Well, I would recommend that uh, until we are able to get this off the ground with, for kids, get your kids involved in 4-H. I know that 4-H actually has some environmental classes that are out there. And so, so extension, well, well, for this program, we may not have it, but if you look at the broader umbrella of mm -hmm. ME extension, we have so many programs. We have youth education as well and nutrition. We, I, we just cover so many different areas. So I bet in your area, there is a program that would that would fit your need for your kids. Well, well to check it out. Tamara, what, what else would you like to leave our listeners with? Um, you know, is there any, any links? Is there anywhere to find you? Uh, I mean, what, what would you like people to know uh, before we before we end this conversation? And I know Katie is already looking to try to, to get you on for a, uh, a, a different topic. Uh, her and I were talking a little bit earlier about it. So but what would you like to leave our listeners with? Well, um, I'm going to say get outside, get outside. Um, just if you don't have a garden, there are lots of parks that you can go to. Just get outside, start looking at the world around you. Take, take a closer look at the flowers, look at the insects that are there and recognize the, the just absolute incredibleness of this world that we have. With that, yes, there are ways that you can contact me. If you look at my name, Tamara Rial, um, on MU Extension, you're gonna find my contact information. I'm also on social media, so MU EXT Bug and Garden. Um, we also have a Facebook, uh, Facebook page, Master Pollinator Steward. So you can find me, I'm out there, I'm pretty easy to reach. Um, I have a YouTube channel, so <laughs> it's hard not to find me. <laughs> Uh, so yeah awesome well i i you know, know you're busy and i appreciate you making the time uh i know i'm better for it. i've 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 learned a lot here um and like i said i there's a, there's a lot that i know but I, there's a lot of details that i don't get to uh you know be in close contact to and, and it's great to be able to speak with you i look forward to speaking with you again hopefully here in the near future anthony it's great to talk with you too thanks take care bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.